you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, so I was um, just introducing Elisa Vergas, who is a third year PhD student working at the Atmospheric Composition Group of the Earth Science Department of the BSc. And she will today talk to us about the modeling uh, of iron deposition into the ocean. So, Elisa, thank you. Thanks for presenting me, Maria. So as she said, I'm a PhD student here and Maria is one of my supervisors together with Carlos Perez. And I'm working in the atmospheric composition group of the Earth Science Department. And I'm here specifically today because I got a Severo Ochoa Mobility Grant for doing a research stage in, in, in North Carolina State University together with Professor Douglas Hamilton. And today I will present the work for my PhD and also the work I did in, in, in the States. So I will start uh, saying that we are in a global warming context, as you all may know. We have uh, an increase in temperatures year by year, uh, followed by an increase in greenhouse gases. That, and that uh, increase rate has never seen before in the history of Earth. And yeah, that's uh, that's why we say that it's an anthropogenic induced uh, global warming. So if we look into the anthropogenic CO2 cycle, we see that uh, the main sources of uh, CO2 to the atmosphere are fossil fuel combustion and, and, and the use uh, and the change of, of land use. Uh, most of these CO2 it's, uh, it stays in the atmosphere, so 50% more or less. And then some part of the CO2, uh, it's trapped by land and oceans. So here we will focus on, on the ocean as a carbon sink, and it's thought to uh, be uh, uptaking at, uh, more or less 23% of, of, of the CO2 in, in, in the atmosphere. So here, uh, researchers are currently asking themselves, how does the ocean sink work? Uh, so they, they need to understand this uh, very good in order to project CO2 changes and, and evolution of, of, of the global climate. And there are other researchers and, and private uh, companies that are trying to uh, increase the, the, CO, the CO2 uptake by the oceans anthropogenically. So why I'm telling this, that's because uh, here we focus on, on the iron and the iron uh, as stated by Jay Martin in 1988, uh, can be used uh, as a booster for CO2 uptake in the ocean. So he uh, proposed the iron hypothesis and it can be summarized uh, by, the, by this sentence uh, that he said. He said, give me half a tanker of iron and I will give you an ice age. So basically the idea behind that is that if you throw iron to the ocean, it can be used by marine biota as micronutrient, which will uh, produce uh, photosynthesis, respiration, and nitrogen fixation, and will consume CO2 from the atmosphere in this process. So this is something that he proposed as an anthropogenic experiment, but this is something that happens naturally in, in, in the air system. Iron, it's emitted to the atmosphere, mostly from dust sources. Uh, from arid and semi-arid regions of the world. And then we have, this is the main source of iron to the atmosphere, but we also have a uh, contribution from combustion emissions, both from biomass burning and anthropogenic activities like industrial and transportation activities. There are other sources of iron to the ocean, but those are restricted to, to near coastal regions. So the main input of iron to the open ocean, it's atmospheric deposition. That's why I'm talking about iron in the atmosphere. When iron is transported through the atmosphere, uh, it encounters several chemical processes. So iron, it's important to say that iron, when it's emitted, it's uh, mainly emitted in its insoluble form. And when in the atmosphere, it's transformed to its soluble form. And there are three main known pathways to utilization of iron. The first one is acidic dissolution, where so with more acidic conditions in the atmosphere, we have more solubilization of iron. 
Then we have organic ligand promote dissolution where organic ligands such as oxalate uh, break iron oxide bonds and create soluble iron um, states. And then we also have photoreductive processes. And why do we care about the soluble iron fraction? It's because when it's deposited over the open ocean, it's the fraction of, of iron that can be used by marine biota as a micronutrient. So this is. This process is especially important in some regions of the open ocean, which are known as high nutrient low chlorophyll regions, where we have high, um, high concentrations of nutrients such as phosphate, nitrate, and silicic acid that are key for marine biota. So you see here, for example, in the Southern Ocean, high concentrations of those three nutrients. But then when we look at the response of marine biota to, to this availability of nutrients, we don't see uh, such a, a huge impact on, on, on primary productivity, like in, in marine biota productivity. So we see, he, we see that through chlorophyll images from, from satellites. And you see here in the Southern Ocean, we, we have like high productivity, but it's not as much as expected with, with the high levels of nutrients we see here. So we say here, we say that in those regions, uh, nutrient, it's the limiting factor for marine biota productivity. So with a, a little increase in iron, you would expect a huge uh, increase in marine biota productivity. So we, we can say that those regions here are the anemic ocean regions. In fact, there are evidences that iron was a key factor in other um, climate times. Like we, we see that uh, high iron deposition in the last glacial maximum. So in this study, they, they analyzed um, some um, deposition, um, how it's called, the, course, yes, the position course that they extract from the earth crust uh, above the, the, the ocean. And they can, know, uh, they, they can analyze and, and, and know how much iron was deposited in past times and how much CO2 was in the atmosphere at the time and, and, and other factors. So you see here in, the, in this plot that CO2 was uh, very low in the last glacial maximum here. And this was accompanied by, by a high iron flux as you see here, and a high dust flux and a high al alkanon flux, which is a proxy for ocean productivity. So uh, we see that dust is one of the main sources of iron uh, in the atmosphere, but uh, there are recent studies that highlight that other sources like, like biomass burning are also key for primary productivity. So this nature uh, paper shows a uh, case study uh, after the Australian wildfires in 2020, where they see that chlorophyll levels in, in the Pacific Southern Ocean and the South of Australia uh, were, were high, higher than, than average. And, and they also see that aerosol optical depth uh, in those areas, aerosol optical depth is a measure of how much aerosols you have in a column of, of, of atmosphere was also, uh, Peaking at that time. So you can see here in the time evolution of both aerosol optical depth and chlorophyll levels a peak uh, after the wildfires in, in, in Australia. However, there are other implications of iron fertilization. Uh, after the, the proposal of Martin in 1988, there were um, companies like fisheries that were trying to just uh, dump iron to the ocean in order to increase population of fishes, for example. But we also have other impacts that are not well constrained right now, like nutrient roving. So you, if you increase uh, iron deposition in a certain area of the open ocean, you will have more pr marine productivity there, and you will consume not only iron, but other nutrients. And those nutrients, which normally would go to other parts of the ocean, stop going there, and you maybe have a and a decrease in primary productivity in other regions because you are stealing those nutrients. Then you also have other impacts like uh, we also, well, it's also been shown that 
uh, an increase in primary productivity leads to uh, em emissions of other climate relevant gases like, like DMS, dimethyl sulfide. And this is a key uh, ga gas in the atmosphere because it's known to be used as nuclear particle for cloud formation. So we could end up having more clouds and uh, changing the climate in other ways that we so there are other side effects we still don't know, and it's something that we have to take into account when, take, when talking about the iron cycle. So the scientific questions in my PhD thesis, it's mainly to improve our understanding and quantify the atmospheric bioavailable supply to, to the ocean and its climate impacts. So we want to know how much iron it's coming from anthropogenic versus natural sources. We want to quantify the different contribution of the different solubilization mechanisms, And we also want to see how those different things have been changing since the pre-industrial era into, into the end of this, the, the century. And we would like to end up seeing how those different changes uh, alter the other biogeochemical cycles. So in order to do so, we use an air system model, which is composed in its core by a climate system model, uh, where the atmosphere is um, divided by lat long. So you, you have a, a discretization of, of the atmosphere and, and, and some, um, some parameterizations are resolved in each of these boxes, uh, accounting for, for differences, different processes. So climate system models started at mid uh, 70s, accounting for the atmosphere and the ocean. But now we can account uh, with more processes in those, in those models. And we are working now with the, what we call air system models, where we, where we have aerosols represented, we have dynamic vegetation, atmospheric chemistry, and so on. So as you may expect, those are computational uh, needing like they, those types of, of models need uh, high computational resources and we have to run them in, in supercomputers as Maria Nostrum and we end up with uh, hundreds of lines of codes uh, mostly written in, in Fortran. So the, the air system model we are using here in this work is is the earth. Is the earth is uh, Air system model co-developed by different uh, European institutions. BSC is one of these institutions, and it's composed by several modules that uh, represent each uh, air system component. So we have an atmospheric dynamic module, which is IFS, uh, ocean module, which is NEMO. Then we have a dynamic vegetation module, which is FPJGS, and then we have an atmospheric chemistry module, which is the the one we are modifying in order to introduce all the uh, I, the atmospheric iron cycles. So yeah, that's where, where, where we are working. And we mostly run our, so you can couple the different components of the air system model. And yeah, we are working right now on, on, on simulations coupling the atmospheric chemistry with the IFS. Uh, yeah, that's it. So when trying to constrain the atmospheric iron cycle in the atmospheric chemistry module, we encounter the different challenges. The first one is that the spatial distribution and time evolution of iron sources, it's hard to constrain. So for example, dust is known to be a non-homogeneous entity, uh, meaning that, for example, you see here, plumes of dust having different colors, that means that they have probably different characteristics. And this has been neglected in the past in, in the models. So usually in the past, models have been treating dust as an homogeneous species. And this, this is very important for iron because uh, yeah, we have to take into account mineralogy in order to know how much iron do we have in dust. It's also very hard to know how, how much iron do we have in combustion emissions. We have plenty of different combustion emissions and it's difficult to to, to put that on models. And then it's also difficult to, to, to see how, how dust emissions, but also combustion emissions, for both from anthropogenic activities and biomass burning have been changing with, with time. And this is hard because you have to take into account uh, not only emissions like anthropogenic activities, but also how 
anthropogenic activities interact with land use change and with climate change. So it's, it's a complex um, a complex problem that we are trying to, to improve and solve. And then we also have a high complexity of atmospheric chemistry involved in our model. And last but not least, we have few observations of iron deposited over the ocean. So it's hard to validate our models. So here you have a plot of uh, the observations we have now of iron deposition, and you see some areas of the ocean with no, no observations. Moreover, those observations are um, inhomogeneous because we, sometimes they use different methods to uh, quantify soluble iron. So with all that, we will, we, we will this new version of the easy earth where, where iron is accounted. And we added mainly three main uh, new tracers uh, for, for each of the new sources accounted. So we have a new trace for tracer for iron coming from dust, taking into account soil mineralogical composition information. We have a tracer for iron coming from biomass bearing, and we have a tracer for iron coming from anthropogenic combustion. Then we account for this complex chemistry in our model with acidity calculations on, online computed, which is something very novel. Uh, we have a comprehensive phase chemistry scheme, and we have an explicit description of the three different mechanisms I explained uh, in which iron is transformed to soluble iron. We evaluate that uh, against, against observations, and we mainly see that we overestimate a bit uh, iron soluble iron deposition over equatorial and tropical areas of the ocean, and we underestimate the iron deposition in, in the Southern Ocean. But again, observations are, are low, and, and, and they use different techniques to measure soluble iron, so yeah. With this model, uh, my first paper of the thesis was about soluble iron deposition, deposition scenarios. We were, we were able to run the model under different climate scenarios for pre-industrial, present time, and future time. So we based our scenarios in the World Climate Research Program scenario, climate scenarios, which is like the standard for climate research. And for the future time, we select three different future scenarios which are different because consider different socioeconomic pathways and force, radiative forcings at, at the end of the century. So we have SSP 370, which would be like a drastic, more dramatic scenario with increasing anthropogenic emissions. And then we have a SSP 245, where would be a middle of the road scenario and SSP 126, where mitigation strategies are, are increased. So basically we run 30 years of each of the scenarios because it's the standard for climate simulations in order to consider climate variability. And yeah, that's it. So from the results of, of those simulations in terms of uh, annual iron emission budgets, we see that iron coming from dust uh, are, is, is the main contributor to, to the total of iron emissions for all the scenarios. And we don't see a huge change between the scenarios. If we look at the iron coming from fossil fuels, we see that for the pre-industrial, that was mm, negligible. But then for the future, we have a, a range of possibilities, like from SSP 1 to 6, where you see a drop in, in fossil fuel emissions and iron fossil fuel emissions to SSP 370, where, where you see a huge increase compared to present day. For biomass burning iron emissions, we see uh, a decrease for the future scenarios for the three of them, regardless of, of their mitigation strategy. And the brain dust, for the brain dust here, we see a, a slight decrease compared to present day too. So we can see how the iron emitted to the atmosphere is, the, is then transformed to soluble iron. And we can uh, quantify how much iron is transformed for each of the processes and from each of the sources. So in yellow, you have iron coming from dust that it's transformed to soluble iron. And in blue green, blue green, you have iron coming from combustion aerosols that it's been transformed to soluble iron. So you see that for iron coming from dust, 
the main solubilization pathway is uh, acidic dissolution. And for uh, iron coming from combustion aerosols, the main dissolution process is uh, ox uh, oxalate bromide dissolution. And we see that um, photoreductive processes are, have a limited impact for, for all of the scenarios and, and sources. If we look at the soluble iron deposition fields for each of the scenario, so you can see here the, uh, the deposition field for the present day, where the maximum of soluble iron deposition, it's downwind uh, the main iron sources, which are North African dust regions. Uh, and then if we compare that to the other scenarios, we see that for the pre-industrial, we had uh, half the emissions, the, the, the soluble iron deposition we have for the present day. And for the future scenarios, we have different um, possible uh, endings. So we, uh, for SSP 1 to 6, we have a reduction compared to present day. For SSP 2 to 5, we also have a slight reduction. And then for SSP 3 to 0, we see a, an increase in soluble iron deposition. However, th those are global budgets. If we look at regional, um, regional signals, we see that for, for the Southern Ocean, which I said it's a high nutrient, low chlorophyll region, we see a, a decrease in soluble iron deposition for all three future scenarios. And for example, for the Equatorial Pacific, which was also a high nutrient, low chlorophyll region, we see an increase in the three future scenarios. As we can account for the different sources, we can know how, how much soluble iron is coming from each source when it's deposited over the ocean. So in these plots, you can see uh, the, the contribution of the different sources to the soluble iron deposition. In yellow, you see that iron is coming mainly from, from dust. In blue, you have iron coming from, from biomass burning. And in pink, you have iron coming from, from anthropogenic activities. So you see for, for, for the pre-industrial where we have like a pristine atmosphere in the Northern hemisphere, iron coming from dust is the one that dominates. And for the Southern hemisphere, we have, uh, we have, an, we have uh, the impact of, of biomass burning very apparent here. Then for the present day, we see that anthropogenic emissions start to, 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 to play a key role in some regions and for the future, for all three futures, we see an increase in, in, in the contribution of iron coming from anthropogenic combustion in the east of Asia. And this uh, increase in, in the contribution from anthropogenic um, sources, it's uh, been highlighted with, with the scenario with less mitigation strategies. So as conclusions, for, conclusions from, from those results, we see that with, anthrop with increased anthropogenic emissions, and uh, we have an increase in not only in, in, in iron, but also in atmospheric acidity and oxalate concentrations. And this leads to, to an increase in soluble iron deposition. So yeah, we see that global soluble iron deposition will increase by 40% with a weak climate mitigation policies and will decrease 35% uh, with a weak one. We see that aerosol acidity controls the dissolution of iron from dust and oxalate uh, promote dissolution, it's the one controlling uh, the dissolution of, of iron coming from combustion aerosols. Uh, however, we, we notice that should, uh, we need further studies dealing with, with the evolution of fire and dust emissions and its interaction with other air system components because yeah, we, we already see that, uh, for example, uh, fires are not well constrained for SSPs. Semi six SSPs and also dust emissions are very hard to to model like the, the evolution over the time in, in such models. So um, this is this is the, the next work I, I started to do in in the scope of the of my doctoral stage with Douglas Hamilton in NC State University, and we try to reassess the future fires in order to see the implications in the iron cycle. So I, as, as I already said, semip 6 underestimates fire emissions for the future, and that's because it doesn't consider uh, the impacts of climate change on, on, on fires in the future. So it only considers anthropogenic changes, disturbances. And this leads to uh, an unrealistic uh, prediction of reductions in emissions across all the scenarios and regions. 
So what we did uh, was to, to do a reassessment of those future fires, taking into account not only SSP CMIP6 emissions that I already used, but also uh, we take, it, take into account ensemble means of CMIP6 models. We have interactive fires. So those models uh, take into account uh, the, different, the, the feedbacks between climate change and fires, and we can uh, take the output of those models and do an ensemble mean and use it uh, and use that uh, in order to infer how climate change impacts future fires. So we combine those two data sets and we bias correct this, this new data set to, towards observations in the present day. So you can see here an example of the SSP 370 scenario. So the last column, the third one, it's the semi 6 SSP scenario, SSP emission inventories, the ones I used for, for my previous work. And as you see here, this third bar is getting down with, with decades until the end of the century. And then the first column, you have the ensemble of those two data sets where you see an increase with time. And then when we bias correct, which is the middle one, and it's the, the, the one we, we use at the end for, for our new reassessment, it's, it's also getting a, an increase in, in, in emissions of, of fires. If we see how those uh, fire emissions are changes are distributed over the globe, we see especially that we expect an increase in future fires in boreal regions uh, with respect to what, with what uh, the SSPs were predicting. predicting. And that's something we are already seeing with, with the uh, Canadian wildfires are happening now. So we will, we, our plan is to use ECF, ECF iron and the model that uh, Douglas Hamilton has in, in the US, MIMI CAM6, in order to run new simulations with, with the new uh, fires estimates. So our hypothesis is that uh, soluble iron deposition will increase in some of the high nutrient low chlorophyll regions, such as the Southern Ocean and the North Pacific, because they are close to some of these boreal regions. And then we also expect changes in fire, that changes in fire emissions will affect the solubilization of iron in the atmosphere because uh, ox oxalate, which is one of the uh, organic ligands used for, for the solution, uh, has uh, as precursors uh, some of the uh, biomass burning aerosols. So I started to run some of these simulations with, with, with a model in the US. And this is some preliminary results I have. And if I compare uh, for SSP 126 uh, in, at the end of the century, the soluble iron deposition with the new estimates, with the old estimates, I see an increase in soluble iron deposition here where you see the red things. And if we see uh, the different contributions to the soluble iron deposition, for, from what we had with the, with the normal SSP126 with the new SS, SSP126, we see a huge impact, a, a huge increase in, in the source contribution of biomass burning in the Arctic Ocean. And we see in some er areas of the Arctic Ocean, fluxes that are 20, 20 times bigger than, than were before estimated. So all in all, we, we have set a promising model baseline for ECR accounting for an explicit representation of the atmospheric iron cycle that allows us the quantification of soluble iron deposition under a range of different scenarios. We have seen that different future socioeconomic pathways lead to important changes in soluble iron deposition. And we have worked on reducing uncertainties such as the estimates of future fires, which we have already seen that can have a huge impact in some ocean areas. And we will we can also work on comparing ECR Thyron with other models, uh, which have uh, lower complexity in their representations of the iron cycle, in order to see if more complexity means better representation of the iron cycle or not. And and yeah, we we conclude saying that considering the iron cycle in 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 our system models is it's important in order to 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 estimate the impacts on, on in primary productivity and, and other cycles like the CO2 cycles. And as future work, 
So we would like to tackle the last objective of my thesis, that it's to see the real impact of these new estimates of iron on, on, on net primary productivity. So the, the biogeochemistry module used by UCR is called PISTES, and nowadays uses uh, a constant uh, field, input field of iron, which doesn't change with years. It only has like a monthly change, but it's it's the same every year. I mean, and it doesn't consider changes in, in the past or in the future. So we plan to fit then the, the PISTES model with new estimates, and we also can account for the different sources and how those different sources have an impact in, in net primary productivity. And we also could uh, work on better constraining other uncertainties in the atmospheric iron cycle, like a better representation of the soil mineralogy. So there is a current uh, NASA project called uh, EMIT, where my supervisor Carlos and Maria are working on. Uh, and this uh, project, is, well, it's already working. They have a, a spectrometer in the International Space Station, and then they, they can measure uh, the minerals in, in the in the in those areas, so, and we could use this new data set to, to improve uh, the characterization of iron in 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 our system models. Then we also could work on accounting for anthropogenic dust iron emissions. Like you have some areas where you have, for example, agricultural activities that also emit iron uh, and dust and, and 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 iron, and this is not uh, well accounted in in our system models. Uh, we also know there are recent papers that show that after wildfires, uh, after a week of a wildfires, you can have a, a boost in dust emissions because uh, like you you get rid of, of, of the trees and, and things that you have there and then you have dust emissions there. This is also not well constrained in, in, in models right now. And there are other things we can look like, uh, for example, the, there are recent studies that show that sh shipping emissions in the Arctic oceans will, will increase uh, in the future because uh, ice will melt and it will be easier to navigate those areas. And also uh, this will lead to, to more fishes there and also fisheries will, will increase there. And yeah, there are other things we can look at, but yeah, <laughs> for, for now that's okay. So that's it. Uh, those are all the projects are financing my 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 work, and yeah, if you have questions or anything, I will be glad to answer. Perfect, Elisa. Thanks. Um, I don't know if there's any question from the audience here or online. People online, if you have questions, you can write uh, in the chat or or raise your hand. I don't know if you can raise your hand. So and. Uh, I will try to, to moderate the discussion. <laughs> no one? Everyone is shy. Everybody is shy. Okay, I will ask you something. I have a hand. Okay. Raise my hand. Okay. Ah, you want? You want to talk? Can you hear me? Yes, but wait. Very, very low. I hear you better because it's my computer. But okay, yeah. Need to shout. Yeah. Th thank you, Lisa. That was great. Um, I have a question. When uh, for the scenarios that you show with fire emissions, uh, so do you is the ice well represented in this? In what, what ice? Yeah, the sea ice in the Arctic. So. Um, so basically, I'm I'm curious to know if 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 there's a good seasonality of the sea ice, because um for instance now for the Canadian fires, uh, I don't know if you've seen that the, there's some nice pictures of all the ash falling uh, over the ice, mm -hmm. and then the idea is that this changes the albedo, so they expect that this year ice will melt um, much faster than. Than, than other years. So I was curious to know if, if you know this coupling between um, emissions and the position and, and, and the seasonality of sea ice is, is well represented in these, these scenarios. Uh, this, so he asks, so yeah. I, I will translate to the audience because they don't hear anything. Yeah. So uh, Joan asks if uh, in the future fires, like the reassessment of the future fire simulations, we take into account sea ice variability. 
in the, in, is that correct, the question? Yeah, more or less. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so the answer is that no, <laughs> that we we run those simulations with present conditions of sea ice and, and meteorology. Mm -hmm. So we, we don't take into account changes in CIs. But he's asking about the models that are you, you use as a basic type, right? Like the fire models that you're using? Ah, uh, you mean that the, the, what do you mean? The simulations the I did with the, with the iron or the future fires reassessment the, without the, the iron? The future fires, the, the, the ones that you show in the, the map for, for the Arctic. With the iron, no. For those, we don't take into account okay. CIs, uh, feedbacks, or anything. So, but for for the new reassessment of of fires, so they take into account uh, climate change feedbacks would be like where CIs changes will be included. But okay. those feedbacks are not connected to the iron after. <laughs> no, no, more than the feedbacks. I was interested to to. Just if there's a way to know if the iron is falling over the ice or over or over ice-free zones. So he you wants know? to know if we could know if iron is falling over the ice so, or over or over the snow. We could use other simulations of ice and 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 compare those two, but no. And it's something that very preliminary, preliminary, and we still have to work on that. Cool. Thank you. No, no. Thanks, Juan. Great. I don't. Uh, I don't know if there's more questions in the in the Zoom or in here. Okay. So I will just ask you one, Elisa. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> And it's about what do you expect uh, from from the this last work that you're doing? You're using now the or you have been using now the mini model, which is more simplified than the easier mm -hmm. model we have here. And uh, I would like to know what I know that you're now conducting these new simulations and you don't have the results yet. But uh, what's what's your opinion? Will it be very different with this year the contribution? the different sources to the iron deposition. Yeah, in fact, we already see in the source contribution maps I showed. I don't know if I can go back. Like if you compare, uh, <laughs> if you compare those maps here, for example, mm -hmm. for the SSP126, which was the one I was showing for the MIMI, mm -hmm. you have high contributions of biomass burning here, for example, in the South Pan Ocean. And when I go to Mimi to the SSP one two six, almost everything is coming from dust. I don't see the same thing now. So that's because dust emissions are parameterized differently in each of the models, and we end up having more dust emissions in in Mimi than for this year. And then we also expect differences of, of in the chemistry happening in the atmosphere. So for for this year, I expect more iron getting solubilized in the atmosphere, not only from biomass burning, but for other sources, because we have a better characterization of, of the processes happening there. Yeah. Great. That would be very interesting. <laughs> OK. If there's no more questions, I don't, I don't see any in the chat or in the room. Then I will just thank Elisa. Uh, we can give her. <laughs> and all the attendants in the in the room and online uh, we will close here yeah thanks to everyone for coming <laughs> bye bye bye